Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled, Your New Sales and Use Tax Obligations Explained. My name is Rihanna Collier. I am Vice President and Managing Director of the Software and Services Division at SIA and also the Tech Council of Southern California. Joining me today is Carolyn Krantz, Founder and Managing Member of Industry Sales Tax Solutions, who will be taking you through today's discussion. Carolyn specializes in state and local tax matters on a multi-state basis, so who better to have explain the new sales and use tax obligations for us? We're very delighted to have her join us today. But before I turn it over to Carolyn, just a few housekeeping reminders. Actually, before I get to the housekeeping reminders, uh, let me go through a little bit about SIA and if you're, for those of you who are unfamiliar with us and a little bit of, about our background. SIA is a global organization representing the interests of technology and media companies. We've been around for over 30 years and have over 750 corporate members. Within SIA, there are multiple divisions and to serve our constituents. And, and across all of the divisions, we strive to advocate on behalf of our members, provide professional and business development opportunities, create peer networking and thought leadership opportunities, and provide pertinent industry education. As you can see there, we have the Software and Services Division, which includes the regional chapter of the Technology Council of Southern California, our SIPA Division, which is our spe specialized publishers, our Education Technology Industry Network provides programming for those technology companies that sell into the education market, and our Financial Information Services Division, which consists of or all those organizations that hold market data. And then finally, our Connective Group, with, which represents information and media organizations. And then in the center of all of our divisions is our Public Policy and our IP Protection Groups that serve all of our members. So how do you get involved? These opportunities you see on the screen apply to all of our divisions. Members are encouraged to, um, to get involved in any of the divisions they like, depending on their interests. Our members can take advantage of our communities, our events, marketing and PR support, market research, and opportunities to showcase their thought leadership through things like speaking opportunities and board participation. So, this slide will give you just an idea of a couple of our in-person upcoming events that are taking place um, in this fall. So you'll see we've got um, an event for your finance executives, um, those involved in data security privacy, IoT, and, and in various cities around the U.S. Okay, so how do you get involved in SIIA? Well, um, we have individual and corporate memberships available. And we'd be delighted to have your, your participation in any or all of our activities. Um, my contact details are there on, on your screen as well as our program manager, Jen Carl. So feel free to reach out to either of us about membership or, or how to get involved. And again, you will receive a copy of the slide deck, so you will have that information at your fingertips. Okay, so before we jump into the discussion today, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. This webinar will be recorded, and the recording along with the slide deck, as I mentioned, will be sent to you later today. All of your phone lines are on mute, so if you would like to ask questions of Carolyn, please use the chat box at the lower left of your screen. Carolyn's going to go into a lot of detail today, and there's a lot to cover. So if we don't get to all of your questions, she will address them offline. I do encourage you to leverage Carolyn's expertise and ask any relevant questions you have while we have her here. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Carolyn Krantz. As I mentioned, Carolyn is uh, the Founder and Managing Member of Industry Sales Tax Solutions. She is also the, a Managing Member with Krantz & Associates. Um, and again, she specializes in state and local tax matters on a multi-state basis. So we are really lucky to have her here because she is definitely an expert in this very complicated field. So Carolyn, I'd like to hand it on over to you. Thank you so much, Rihanna, and thank you to SIA for hosting this webinar today. Um, you know, coming up with the title of this was interesting because we wanted to talk about your new tax obligations explained. Having said that, 
Um, I think it's really helpful that as part of this presentation, we sort of give you a baseline of what your tax obligations have always been. Um, but what has really been the, the precedence behind putting this together now, now what makes this so critical and the timing important now, is the recent uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision in uh, South Dakota versus Wayfair. And, and we're going to talk about that as we get into our discussion um, in a few minutes. The agenda that we put forth today is really to, first of all, understand tax risk. What is tax risk? Why are you worried about this? Uh, spend a good bit of time talking about nexus. When does a company have an obligation to collect a sales tax? And how has the obligation that may have existed for years been impacted by the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision? And then, and then obviously, none of this is helpful if we don't get into some of the complexities of, of how states are taxing different software-related services today, how they are citusing them. So we've got a lot to cover over the next hour or so. And as Rihanna mentioned, I welcome questions. It will obviously be hard to address them as we go through, but I promise you that if I do not answer your questions or address them directly throughout the presentation, I will absolutely send you an email with a follow-up answer to whatever your questions might be. So with that, why is this important to everybody on this call today? In my experience in working with technology-related companies is they tend to start small. If you're lucky, grow quickly. And, and there's usually a long-term goal at the end of the game of, of either going public, selling the business. And it is at that point that I have seen state and local tax issues and specifically sales tax issues sort of rear their ugly head. Um, you've got financial statement drivers, ASC 450, which deals with loss contingencies. Sales taxes fit directly in that. In my years of doing M&A work, I can't tell you how many companies I've come across where I'm not suggesting that sales tax is a deal breaker, but it always became a critical discussion in negotiating sales price, in negotiating escrows and indemnification provisions. And in our practice, we've spent a lot of time cleaning up problems that were identified during acquisition. Um, and why is that important? Because of governmental exposure on audit. Um, state sales tax rules are complicated in the technology industry. And now that the states are getting much more aggressive in inserting jurisdiction over taxpayers, it's becoming ripe with potential issues. So what we're going to do here is really discuss a couple of basics to make sure we all have a very clear and level playing field of where we are so we can get into the real details on the discussion. So just as a baseline for everybody, sales and use taxes constitute approximately 33% of most states' revenue. And today, as we see that sales tax base being eroded by a couple of major factors, one, more and more uh, individuals and businesses moving to purchase goods and services online via the internet from sellers who may not have an obligation to collect. Um, and, and the second thing really being the fact that what we once purchased in a very traditional model, think of a book, think of music, where we would go out and purchase albums, CDs, things of that nature, Things, items that were unquestionably taxable, those types of things, the, the technology is outpacing the law. And the laws aren't addressing the taxability of these items. So we see states seeing their sales tax base eroded, not only with, with transactions occurring online, but also with technology replacing traditional means of doing business. There are 45 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, who impose the sales and use tax. Uh, there are five states that do not have a sales and use tax. Rates range at the state level from 4 to 6 percent, but with locals it can be a, an additional 5 percent. So highest rates we see out there average around 10 percent or, or so. So it can be very high. So where are we going to go with this today? We need to understand the sales and use tax decision-making process. And the first and most critical step of that is understanding does a taxpayer have nexus in the state, meaning do they have an obligation 
to collect the state's sales and use tax, or are they registered? That's also creating an obligation. That's where our next focus is going to be. Once you know the answers to that question, you've limited the jurisdictions you need to worry about. Your next question is going to be, is what I'm selling subject to sales tax in the jurisdictions I've identified? Um, and then it gets even more complicated in the tech industry. Does that state have jurisdiction over the transaction? How do they cite us those? And, and what kind of exemptions might be available to my customers? And I'll give you a few examples as we get through this of some of the, the troublesome areas I've seen in the tech industry specifically. So with that, let's talk about what the standard has historically been. Historically, Nexus required some form of physical presence. And this really comes forth through a variety of Supreme Court decisions, but the most critical having been the Quill decision, which was handed down in 1992. So for a state to require a taxpayer to collect a tax, that taxpayer had to have some presence in the jurisdiction by virtue of having property, employees, or agents in the state soliciting business on their behalf, creating a market on their behalf. And what I have here is a simple list of the types of things that unquestionably created that physical presence. With, as we get to the bottom of that, some being a little more questionable because you could attend a trade show um, and some states really created some exceptions or caveats the, about whether that really truly created an absolute obligation to collect. The problem is the future of Nexus is not only changing, I would argue, based on the Wayfair decision, that it has definitely changed. And, and it's a, a bit of the wild, wild west out there. What we have seen happen over the last couple of years is states beginning to take more aggressive positions and creative approaches to, to mandate collection on remote sellers. And, and if we think back, the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Project, which was an effort by state and local governments to create a more modern and uniform sales and use tax system, which was founded in March of 2000, the, the real nemesis behind that, why that came about, was with the goal of ultimately going to Congress and getting Congress pursuant to their authority under the Commerce Clause to mandate collection on remote sellers. Now, when we think about remote sellers, I think one of the misnomers out there is that a remote seller is a retailer selling online. And the way a remote seller is really defined is a seller who does not have nexus in the state. So when we look at the, the approaches the states have taken, it's unquestionable they've gone after the more traditional retailers, somebody selling tangible goods on the internet. But all of the proposals that are out there unquestionably also have an impact on sellers who are selling non-traditional tangible personal property, software, and services. So the first attempt of states sort of taking things into their own hands is when they began going after sellers through this concept of click-through nexus, which is simply put, I sell online and I have referral agreements with in-state residents who refer sales to my website and I pay them a commission. The states began attacking those, arguing that that in-state resident created a physical presence under the quill standard for the online seller. So that was really the first approach we saw taken by states. The second one was where states put into place um, use tax reporting requirements that were very, very burdensome. And what these requirements did is they required an online seller to have specific notices on their website and on their invoices that made the consumer of their goods or services aware that they might have, the consumer, a use tax obligation in the state. To, to pay a tax directly to the state and that the seller wasn't obligated to collect. What made it burdensome is it was essentially a 1099-like reporting requirement requiring physical mailings to customers at the end of the year, advising them of the purchases they made from that seller throughout the year, 
along with a filing with the state governmental agency of everybody who purchased from that seller and the volume of transactions and what they purchased. And, and what we saw as a result of that was, one, most importantly, a challenge to the constitutionality of it that, that did ultimately make its way to the U.S. Supreme Court, but it made its way to the Supreme Court on a jurisdictional issue. So, so really, the constitutionality of the reporting requirements themselves really named, never came to fruition as far as being evaluated. But more importantly, as we saw a number of sellers begin to voluntarily collect state sales taxes because they found it easier to comply with the burdens of collecting a sales tax than to deal with the use tax reporting requirements, which frankly at the end of the day is what the states were after. But, but lastly, the, the approach we saw taken were economic nexus proposals. And interestingly enough, these proposals that came about came as a direct result of the challenge filed at the U.S. Supreme Court against the use tax reporting regime. Um, Justice Kennedy, who sat on the Supreme Court for the DMA decision, and who also sat on the court when Quill was decided, had issued a concurring opinion, and essentially, through that concurrence, invited a challenge to Quill. So the first state to step in line with the concept of pursuing a collection obligation against remote sellers was Alabama. And Alabama did that via regulation and enacted an economic nexus proposal. But the next in line following Alabama was South Dakota. South Dakota was interesting because South Dakota actually enacted legislation. And if you go through the history, they gave notice to sellers they were going to do this. They enacted legislation with a date to be, to be enforced at some future date. They notified all the sellers they thought this might apply to and suggested that they should register. And they had a provision in their law that said that if they were challenged, the law would be stayed, meaning the law would not be enforced as long as the challenge existed. South Dakota's case is the first one to make it to the US Supreme Court. There are numerous other challenges out there for other states that have enacted a law. The Supreme Court granted cert to hear the case in early 2018. And in June of 2018, they rendered a decision. And this decision is really a critical decision today because the court essentially overturned the physical presence standard that has been applied since 1992 as to whether a seller has a requirement to collect a tax or not. Um, the, the court actually came out and said that the physical presence rule is unsound, an incorrect interpretation of the Commerce Clause. And if you read the decision in detail, they talked about the fact that they created um, a competitive advantage disadvantage for certain businesses. And, and that certainly is what makes it unsound. The court also recognized this concept of virtual and economic contacts, and that virtual and economic contacts can be enough to actually mandate a seller to collect the tax. So let's talk about for a minute where this case stands and what is happening, because does this mean that any state that has enacted provisions similar to South Dakota, and I want to talk about what those provisions are, um, can enforce a tax against anyone else, um, any seller who's doing business in their state. So first and most importantly, it's important to note that the US Supreme Court has remanded the case to the South Dakota Supreme Court. So while they've overturned the Quill physical presence standard, they still have to determine whether South Dakota's law minimizes the burden on interstate commerce enough that it can be deemed constitutional. And it inferred through its, its decision that it might be. The law doesn't apply retroactively. It contains de minimis rules or safe harbors for small sellers. And it also noted that South Dakota is a member of the Streamlined Sales Tax Project and as such has put a number of simplifications in place. It did not specifically note that those simplifications were enough. That's why the case has been remanded. 
So let's talk about what South Dakota did. What does economic nexus mean? South Dakota created a law that essentially said if you are a seller and you have 200 sales a year or $100,000 of sales into our state, that you have a collection obligation. So what that means is if you're below that amount and you don't otherwise have physical presence, then, then you don't have an obligation to collect. But if you have this level of activity, you do. And what's interesting to note about this case is, again, the case dealt with Wayfair. And if you aren't familiar with who or what Wayfair is, it's a company that is selling online and they're selling tangible personal property. And, and they certainly do delivery, installation services, et cetera. But the transaction value uh, volume of a particular transaction can range. There can be small dollar transactions, there can be larger items purchased, seven, eight hundred dollars and probably beyond. But I sat through oral argument and questions were very specifically raised around what Wayfair does and what Amazon does. But one has to wonder when looking at this case whether the court understood the real ramifications because this doesn't apply to just traditional retailers where $100,000 of transaction volume may very well be hundreds and hundreds of transactions. Did they consider that a $100,000 transaction could be one software license in a jurisdiction, and that software license may have been negotiated with a corporate parent in another state? And so, so is, is there really a bright line that's been defined? Not necessarily, but I think practically speaking, States are going to be enforcing these types of provisions unless another taxpayer brings a challenge. And I believe that unless that taxpayer has the right facts and enough dollars at issue, that's going to be highly, highly unlikely. So South Dakota was the first in line. With the case, who, who are the winners and losers? I mean, obviously there are a number of states who are winners and locals and brick and mortar retailers and and software compliance companies who have sales and use tax uh, rates. But from a loser's perspective, obviously the online retailers who now have to collect, startup companies, marketplace providers, foreign sellers, and certainly service providers. And, and again, wondering, did the court really have this in mind when they rendered this decision? So just to put into perspective what we are seeing happening, is these next two slides, and, and again, I know it was noted uh, by Rihanna at the start, these slides will be available for distribution. These next two slides here really demonstrate the number of jurisdictions that have come out with economic nexus-like proposals. And, and note these, I mentioned Alabama was the first in line at 250,000 and one or more nexus-creating activities, but note how many of these jurisdictions mirror the South Dakota provision? And that was obviously very, very intentional of the legislatures of these states. And, and a number of these states, if you look closely, Georgia, Indiana, Kentucky, Minnesota, these are streamlined member states. So in their minds, I, if the South Dakota Supreme Court says yes, South Dakota has done enough to minimize the burdens on interstate commerce. These states have done the same things that South Dakota has done, these streamlined member states. Um, more states than this, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, Vermont, Wyoming, and Wisconsin are all also streamlined member states. There are an awful lot of states on here who feel that they have the authority to collect. We've noted an effectment or enforcement date. Um, some of the states put in place their legislation years ago. If we go back to the Alabama slide, you'll see Alabama's provisions went into effect January 1st, 2016. However, since the Wayfair decision was decided, Alabama, along with many other states, have come out and said, we are not going to retroactively enforce this. We are going to begin enforcing this at a date certain in time in the future. We see a lot of October 1st start dates, some out of January 1st, 2019. 
What I can tell you based on my involvement in, in a lot of these discussions through the Streamline Governing Board and attending some of the regional conferences and speaking on this subject is that states certainly want to work with taxpayers. If there are challenges that taxpayers are incurring, um, they certainly want to try to work with them. And I would suggest if you're planning to start collecting in some of these jurisdictions and you're running into trouble, I, I really think it might be in your best interest to work with the states directly because I think they want to understand the challenges and they want to work with taxpayers, especially taxpayers who are working in good faith to meet these challenges. I also think it's interesting to note that I believe it's since June, we've had at least five or six states enact new provisions legislatively, just since June. So um, I suspect we will see more of these coming out from states that you don't see on these lists. The other thing we're seeing, as I mentioned, is use tax reporting requirements. But you'll see many of these states mirror the other states. And, and some of them are really doing it in a backhanded way. They haven't essentially come out and said $100,000 or 200 transactions in our state. They've instead said, if you have over $15,000 of sales, you have to comply with our use tax reporting regime or collect the tax. And that's a bit of a backhanded way of getting to the same place. So if I were sitting in your shoes, the takeaways with respect to Nexus that you need to be thinking about is you need to be looking at your transaction volume in these states and understanding, do I have an obligation to collect prospectively, but also very closely examining, did you have any traditional nexus creating activities for prior periods? Um, but that's just your starting point. The, the next step, I think, is part of that critical analysis, which is doing an exposure computation. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to the numbers. If you for example, have an obligation to collect sales taxes in, o in Oklahoma, for example, but what you are selling is electronically delivered software or software as a service or infrastructure as a service, and Oklahoma doesn't tax those items, while you may have a filing obligation, you don't have any real exposure. And, and so it's really critical that you understand what it is you are selling and whether the states tax it. Most states tax traditional sales of tangible personal property and only enumerated services. Now, there are a handful of problematic jurisdictions out there for the tech industry. Washington State with digital automated services, Texas with data processing, and Connecticut with computer services. And, and I do have a list where we'll walk through it, at least in regards to a discussion on software as a service. But there are some problematic states, but by and far, most states are not taxing computer services themselves. It's a handful of states. But when you get into cloud-related services and digital products, we see states taking alternative positions. And, and that's what's critical here. So what you have to understand is what are you selling? Is it tangible personal property? Is it software or service, digital good? Is it, is it something else? Is it, sometimes it is pure intellectual property rights. You need to understand how it is delivered, and you need to understand what your agreements and invoices indicate, and your marketing materials for that matter, what they say you're selling. If I'm providing services to a customer, but I have a software license agreement documenting the services I am providing, and an auditor comes in the door, I assure you that auditor is going to believe that you are selling software. If you're providing services but you use the word software on your invoices, again, you're left in a position where you have to rebut um, documentary evidence that the auditors are using. So it's really important to keep those things in mind. And then applying them on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, as I mentioned, most states tax tangible personal property. All states that have a sales tax tax tangible personal property. Here's the streamlined definition of tangible personal property. 24 states in this country use this identical definition. And if you look closely at it, you're going to see that that definition expressly includes the term pre-written computer software. So if you are selling traditional software, regardless of whether it is delivered in tangible form, electronic, 
load and leave, load and return, it is defined as tangible personal property, which means the initial presumption it is that it is taxable unless the state has enacted an exemption. And in fact, many states have enacted exemptions for electronically delivered software or software delivered via the load and leave method. But that would have to be an exemption in any state that expressly includes this in the definition of tangible personal property. And as I mentioned, there are a number of states that do tax services. It's, it's a minority when compared to the whole. But it isn't just a matter of understanding whether the state taxes services, it's understanding what services they tax and whether you fit into the categories for that. And why is that important? Well, in Connecticut, computer services are taxable, but they're taxed at a reduced rate of 1%. So understanding whether you're a business and advisory service or a computer service is critical because it is a material difference on the rate you charge. In a state like Texas, data processing services are taxable, but they're ta there's a 20% exemption for the value of the services. Um, also understanding the applicability of exemptions. When you deal with certain states, like for example, Arizona, who, who has a transaction privilege tax, or New Mexico, who has a gross receipts tax, some of those states limit the ability of exemptions to be passed through to only sales of tangible personal property, and not leases of tangible personal property, or not services. So, you know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but I want to give everybody a flavor of some of the subtleties that exist. And obviously, the characterization will most definitely impact how the state situs is the sale. So let's talk about some specific products and services. So as I mentioned, software, there's a lot of very clear guidance out there with respect to traditional software, um, software that is sold on a CD or electronically delivered, but something that a customer receives and installs on their own server or on their own, um, or on their own uh, laptop, desktop, et cetera. So there's a lot of clear guidance out there on that. Where there's a serious lack of guidance and lack of consistency is when we get into cloud-related services. So I, I put a few slides in here to demonstrate the subtleties and nuances that exist. From the SaaS perspective, what we see are states taking a variety of positions. Some states will argue that software as a service or application service providers are taxable because it represents the sale or rental of pre-written or canned computer software. And I've listed a few specific examples here, each of which has their subtleties. Pennsylvania and Tennessee are a little unique because they've had legislative changes over the last two years where, where the legislature expressly expanded their definition of tangible personal property to include remotely accessed software. Now, in the world of SaaS, what does that mean? Well, keeping in mind, and, and you know, we've got a variety of companies on the phone who, who are in these industries, so, so obviously you know your industry well, and, and if you know what the SaaS world looks like, you've got two extremes. You've got one end, which is where we take models of software that were traditionally available for install on our computers, and we can now remotely access them via the cloud and install nothing on our machines. As a small business owner, I use QuickBooks Online, and that is the perfect example of remotely accessed software in the SaaS world, right? But at the other end of the extreme is something that's always been considered a service, a payroll processing service, for example, where I may have the ability to systematically input hours or rates or upload that data, but at the end of the day, the service provider is processing the payroll, um, making tax payments, uh, processing checks, making direct deposits. Um, that is also software as a service. And, and that's where some of these states, it gets a little tricky, because where is that line drawn? And, and it's a tough decision to make. And so if you are selling something that was traditionally available in another model, I would be really cautious 
of the six or so states I have listed here. If you've always sort of been a pure service provider, then I'm not suggesting these states won't try to assert that what you're selling is pre-written computer software, but you've got a much stronger argument. Then we go into the states that have taxes on services. So I've already mentioned Connecticut taxes computer services and Texas data processing. South Carolina takes the position that software as a service is the sell of a telecommunications service. I, I professionally believe that's a bit extreme, but again, until somebody challenges them, they're going to hold strong on that position. Washington took a bit of a unique approach because they legislatively enacted a tax on what they define digital automated services. They also um, impose a tax on remotely accessed software. So they tax pre-written computer software regardless of the delivery method. They tax remotely accessed software and they tax digital automated services, which are very, very, very broadly defined with a lot of subtle exceptions to that. So that's a little bit of a spectrum of where you see states with unquestionable authority. Then we have states that have not been taxing SAS or are moving not to tax SAS. And this is a moving target. And you're going to see I have a lot of notes here. Um, states that, that just view it as it's not an enumerated service. You see a number of streamlined states up there, Wisconsin, New Jersey, Nebraska, Kansas. But Michigan is a streamlined state that was back arguing what the first classification of states here were, Arizona, Mass, New York, and PA, arguing that SAS was the sale of pre-written computer software. They were challenged uh, by auto owners, and it went up to the Michigan Supreme Court, and the Michigan Supreme Court held in favor of the taxpayer. So Michigan has backed off of that position. But note Iowa, who had guidance out there that it wasn't that SAS was not an enumerated service, is going to begin taxing it January 1st, 2019. Um, we also have states that have actually come out and put in place statutory exemptions, the most recent being Indiana. And, and there's a little bit of a tail behind that, Indiana also being a streamlined state. But they were attempting to tax SAS as pre-written computer software, backed off of that. Um, recently, in the last year or so, came out with a ruling that a SAS model was taxable as a telecommunications service and caused a bit of an uproar in the business community in Indiana. And, and they went to their local chamber and were able to push forth legislation. Um, that legislation does have a sunset date, but sunset dates can be unpredictable. And then we have states who've never come out with a position because they don't tax electronically delivered software, they don't tax computer services, so there's really no reason that they see to offer guidance. In the infrastructure as a service area, uh, so think web hosting, think managed services, remote storage, we see states, again, with a lot of inconsistency. Some states clearly saying, this is not a service we tax. Others picking it up in their broad-based um, computer services or data processing. And then we have you know, a minority of states out there, Utah being one. And, and I can tell you there's been um, some rulings issued by Vermont recently where they view it as the lease or rental of tangible personal property. If there are any infrastructure as a service providers on the phone, you know that that is probably a pretty preposterous position given unquestionably your customers are not touching those machines and they really exercise no custody, possession, or control over them. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what we're seeing out there. Um, what I would say to you in this area as a takeaway is, is after you put together your next estate, you need to look closely to see what the states you are in are taxing and the positions that they, they might take. I think the charts I've just given you give you a good flavor of, for the variety of positions out there. And you just need to understand there's not really a one size fits all. Um, you really need to look closely at the rulings and the guidance out, issued out there on a state by state basis. And, and yeah, it is unfortunate that it is so complicated, but um, it, it is what it is. And I will tell you in the Streamline Sales Tax Project, they've addressed the taxability of pre-written computer software and digital products, books, music, and movies, but they have not touched software as a service. Now, 
Once you've determined that a state can, in fact, tax what you're doing, you're left with the next critical issue. And, and in my opinion, after I discussed how complicated characterization was, I've always thought this to be one of the more challenging areas, understanding when a state is going to tax the transaction. When it comes to traditional tangible personal property, states have traditionally followed a destination concept. But if you think back to the slide we discussed a few minutes ago with software as a service and those handful of states like a Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, who are taking the position that remotely access software is the sale of tangible personal property, the concept of destination, you know, how does that fall in? Destination in the area of software was traditionally the install location of the software. And, and in a cloud environment, well, one, the purchaser may not know where that location is, but more importantly, there may not be one location. There could be 20 locations, 100 locations, 1,000 locations in different countries, each of which is being accessed at some different point in time. When I log on to QuickBooks Online right now, I might be accessing a server in one location and 10 minutes later somewhere else because of load balancing. So that's, that's what has made this a little bit more complicated. Those states that are attempting to tax SAS as a sale of pre-written computer software are unquestionably moving towards this concept of use user location, where are the users sitting? And we're going to talk about the complexities of that from a seller's perspective and a purchaser's perspective. Services have traditionally followed more of a benefit. Where is the benefit of the service derived? And what I see states wanting to see is where are the users of the service? And, and that's really important. Um, digital goods, again, not clearly defined, but what I'm seeing traditionally happening in the world of books, music, movies is a presumption that the location of use is the location of the billing address. So when I download uh, a book onto one of my devices, um, you're going to see, I'm going to see DC tax charged on, on my invoice because there's a presumption by the vendor that that's where I'm using it even though I, I might have read that book while I was sitting in Seattle earlier this week. So with that, what's important to note or what makes this complicated is the fact that traditionally in the sales tax world, a item that was sold was cited to one location because the world at one time was a much simpler place, right? I mean, sometimes corporations had one place of business and everybody sat in that one place of business. Now we've used, moved into the world of telecommuting. Um, anybody can access anything from anywhere. And, and so as the states are, are moving to tax things like cloud services and digital products, and they're moving to tax things based on where that use occurs or the benefit occurs, it is becoming broadly understood that that may not be a single location. And with that, it could be multiple locations. So I could have a data processing service that I am providing for a corporation that five different locations are using. And arguably, the incidence of tax may be in all five locations, depending on the rules of each of those states. And, and so and I, I, I want to sort of flip to the next slide because I think that this will probably demonstrate it the best way, is that there are different considerations for sellers versus purchasers. The items I talk about here with allocating and apportioning the base, in my experience, sellers don't want to see, they don't want to think about. So I'm going to flip back to this in one second. What a seller wants to do, in my experience, is they want to collect as little data as they can at the time of sale, so systematically they only have to charge one state's tax. I see this regardless of whether it's a small seller or a big seller. Some of the largest sellers in this country I've worked with, and they've told me they have very sophisticated sales and use tax systems, and yet those sales and use tax systems only give them the ability currently to charge one state's tax on one line item of an invoice. And, and that's a problem. 
And so I see sellers approaching this sort of with blinders on. What's on the invoice? What's on the contract? That's all I want to know. For sophisticated sellers who do understand that benefits can be derived in multiple locations, and they have the systematic abilities to do it, they could get an affidavit from their customer attesting to use. And flipping back here, what would that affidavit say? It, it might show here's where we expect our usage to be. And we expect it to be in states A, B, and C, and it's going to be 20% here, 30% here, and 50% here. And that's what they're going to be charging tax based on. And if you have the systematic ability to do it and you're going to do it, my, my one word of warning is do it based on percentages if you get that affidavit. Don't do it based on numbers of users. Remember, auditors are accountants at heart. I'm an accountant at heart. If I have a license or an agreement that has 100 users in it, the auditor wants to see it add up to 100 users. Percentages will cover you if there really are only 95 users. That's something critical to think about. What's more important is some states that have moved to taxing based on a location of user or based on a location of benefit have in fact recognized that this is uh, an area that is very difficult for sellers to deal with systematically, and they've come up with exemption certificates that sellers can exempt. And I'm going to talk about those um, at the tail end of this so you can understand what they look like and, and what you might be able to accept. But flip side, I've got my seller's hat on, and I have systematic limitations on what I can charge, so I want to know as little as possible. Now, now put your purchaser's hat on and think about it. If I'm in New York State, and New York State has rates close to 9%, and they tax software as a service, and they tax it based on use location, and the seller who's selling to me has only my New York bill to address, what do you think is going to happen on that invoice? I'm going to be charged tax on 100% of that transaction at almost 9%. But 90% of my users might be in other states. Some of those states might be non-tax states, like a New Hampshire or a um, Delaware. Or perhaps they are states like a New Jersey that one doesn't tax staff and has an exemption for electronically delivered software that is sold to a business for use in the business, right? Wouldn't I as a purchaser want to legally minimize my sales tax base? Of course you would. And, and so this is sort of that catch-22 you run into, right? It's because as a seller, you want to make sure if a state comes in and audits you, you're as compliant as you can be, especially when the sales tax is not your tax. It's a tax you're collecting in many instances in an act fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the state. It's your customer's tax. Yet at the same time, you don't want to overcharge your customers, especially if you are in a competitive industry. right? You don't want to be situated with a seller who knows how to do this. So you need to be cognizant of this. And that's why it's helpful for states that have come out with exemption certificates and I, I use New York very specifically in my example because they don't have one, which means in New York, you're either going to overcharge or you've got to figure out how to do it properly at the state level, and that's a problem. The other thing from a purchaser's perspective is if, if I know what I'm doing, one, I don't want to pay more tax than is legally due, but, but let's say New York were a low-rate state. Let's say we're only at 5.5%. Um, maybe I would just want to pay it because at the end of the day then I can prove I paid the tax. Well, any state that comes in and, and notices that I have concurrent or subsequent use in that state can still impose a tax upon me. And they might choose not to give me a credit for the tax I paid to New York with the argument that that tax wasn't legally imposed. New York did not have the right to tax that transaction. So it creates this nightmare of refunds. And in some states, that purchaser has to come back to the seller. So administratively, it could become more burden down the road for you as a seller if you don't do it right. Um, we're working with a client right now in Minnesota, um, and Minnesota taxes electronically delivered software, and that's my client's bill to address. But interestingly enough, 
their uh, data centers are not in Minnesota. They are in a number of other jurisdictions, some of which have pretty favorable rules with respect to technology. And what we are seeing is that most of the sellers they're working with are charging them Minnesota sales tax. And to give you an example of the dollars at issue, we've identified over $4 million of overpaid sales taxes at this point. That, that's how material these amounts can be to some purchasers. And purchasers who have that kind of spend become savvy quickly when they realize they're overpaying in that amount. So that's why it's really important to know. But also, if you're a big business, you need to understand, am I overpaying? Look at, if you're a big business, look at what you're spending on technology a year. You will be quite surprised at the value of that. So in, in sort of the, the tail end of this, what I want to discuss, because presumably most of the folks on this call today are on the selling side, but even if you're not, you need to understand these subtleties, is, is what kind of documentation can you as a seller receive from your customer to minimize your burden to collect the tax at the time of sale? And as a purchaser, what can you do to take the, the burden of having to, to determine use at the time of sale, which you may not know, versus after the fact? So as I mentioned earlier, a number of states have come up with a concept of an exemption certificate for multi-state use. Um, I have a, a handful of them here. And I, I have a handful here because each of them has their own subtleties. Um, I'm sure many people on this call are not appreciating the complexity of this. I can also tell you when I'm working, talking to an in-house tax department or other practitioners, some people appreciate this and call it job security. I know that's, that's a little unfair, but um, these complexities exist because we are working with a sales tax, um, sales tax policies that were built in a manufacturing error, and we have very much moved away from that to, to a very technology-oriented economy. And that's what's making this complicated. States that have updated their laws, such as, as Washington, have much clearer guidance out there, and it's much clearer cut versus those that have not. Um, Minnesota is unique. Minnesota is a streamlined state. And years ago in Streamline, we developed uh, a concept called multiple points of use. And what multiple points of use did is it allowed a purchaser who was purchasing software, digital goods, or computer services that would be concurrently used in multiple jurisdictions the ability to issue an exemption certificate to the seller thus relieving the seller of the obligation to collect and would put the burden on the purchaser to accrue the tax based on the jurisdictions of use and based on the taxing rule of those jurisdictions. The MPU provisions were repealed from the Streamline Agreement. Um, they were repealed really because there was controversy in the business community. The, the sellers obviously uh, uh, loved the concept because it eliminated the burden for them to collect. Um, some purchasers liked the concept because they were in high-rate jurisdictions that broadly tax tech services. Think Washington State, Ohio, et cetera. And then there were purchasers who did not like it. Um, think of companies who were in tax-favorable jurisdictions, like a California or Virginia or in a Delaware where there is no sales tax. And, and they didn't like it because the fear was that multiple points of use essentially created um, a, an ability for a state to impose tax on a jurisdiction, on a transaction that a state didn't otherwise have jurisdiction with. In other words, historically, if software is tangible personal property, the only state that have, should, should have jurisdiction over that is the state where the property is physically located. And if we were now taxing based on use, weren't we really migrating away from that policy view? And was that good tax policy? And were we giving the states the ability to tax something that they never really had jurisdiction over? So it was repealed. Oddly, with that repeal, we still have a number of states that have it on the books or have created their own variation of it. Minnesota is one of them. What Minnesota essentially did is they clearly taxed computer software based on where it is physically residing on the server. 
they created an exemption for in-state businesses to apportion the base out if use is outside of Minnesota. But they did it with very specific caveats. You can, taxpayer, avail yourself of this, this exemption only if you issue an exemption certificate at the time of purchase to the seller and you accrue tax and remit it to Minnesota. And so a number of taxpayers over the years have come back after the fact, realizing, wait a minute, I, I could have issued an exemption certificate and I did not, and Minnesota is telling them we're denying your refund claim because you did not meet the requirements of the exemption. So very, very, very tricky in Minnesota. If you're a seller, be cautious of accepting an exemption certificate after the time of sale. Um, in Ohio, they still have a very, very, very broad provision, which was the original provision in Streamline. And, um, and as such, you even have a second chance on audit to get that exemption certificate. As I already mentioned, New York does not have any provisions, so there's no opportunity to issue that, even though New York tax is based on user location. And in Tennessee, which is really the last one that I, I, it's critical for me to hit, is doing something very unique because they tax pre-written computer software, whether it's delivered in tangible form, electronic form, or it's remotely accessed. But all three of those items are pre-written computer software. They tax them as the same thing, but they cite a software that is delivered to a customer so tangible form, electronic form, based on the installation location and software that is accessed based on the user location. I would have no issue with the distinctions in citusing if they were taxing remotely accessed software as a standalone item or as a service. My issue is they're treating it no differently than pre-written computer software. It's part of the same definition. Therefore, I don't see how you can cite us based on delivery method for one in one way versus delivery method for another in another. It, it would be like taking a chair, and because one chair is red, one is black, and one is blue, citusing them differently. I'm going to citus this one based on where I ship it from. I'm going to citus this one based on where I ship it to. It's the same thing. It's a chair. So I, I think Tennessee has really... Um, has really taken their policy to an extreme and has gone the wrong way with that. Um, lastly, I want to talk about Texas, and, and Texas is noteworthy because Texas for years has had this concept of service benefits and has allowed an exemption certificate for services used out of state. But tennis, uh, Texas's exemptions, or, or I should say status re regime, is very unique because it only allows apportionment in certain instances. We recently worked with a client who thought they had a refund claim, and they were going to apportion their tax base uh, based on number of users. And when we looked very, very closely at these provisions, um, you only apportion the base if, it's, if the service is used to support a separate identifiable segment of a customer's business. So if I've got divisions in my own business and it's used for one or another, that's, that's, that's when I can, I can claim a multi-state benefit. But if it's used only for one, it's, it's presumed to be used where that business is conducted. That turned out to be pretty favorable in our instance because our client's corporate headquarters was outside of Texas. So rather than apportioning and filing a refund claim based on use, we filed a refund claim based on where the business was conducted, which resulted in a 100% request. Um, so it's, it's, I point this out because there are these little subtleties that exist, and the devil is in the details on these. Um, with that, you know, what we're just trying to do here is really demonstrate what types of exemptions are available, the complexities that exist. Um, I know it's a lot to take in. I, will, I promise, because I know we're running out of time to address any questions you have and get back to you. Um, I know Rihanna said the slides are going to be available for, for use and distribution, but, but hopefully you'll understand that you've really got to drill down to the details on a state-by-state -state basis. And with that, Rihanna, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you for final comments, and, and thank you for hosting today.
No, thank you, Carolyn. That was fantastic. There's so much, there's so much content here. I know you could probably speak to us for hours. Um, again, we are at the top of the hour, and I want to be appreciative of everybody's time. So I'm going to let Carolyn address the questions that have come in via email. So we will get those to you a, as soon as possible. And again, the slides and the recorded presentation will be sent to you later today. So feel free to share that with your colleagues as well. And it will also be archived on the SIA website. Um, so Carolyn, thank you again, and thank you all for joining us.